Hi, I'm Megan Baker, and this is Influence Her, produced and sponsored by Baker Public Relations. On this episode, we speak with Marissa Ackley, also known as The Warrior by ICU doctors and nurses. She has a story about survival just as COVID-19 hit the United States back in 2020. Thank you for talking to us and sitting down with us today, sharing your remarkable journey. You spent uh, several days in the intensive care unit where your life was touch and go. Uh, you had bacterial pneumonia yes. and septic shock. Right. Tell us about those days, what you can recall, right. and through accounts from your husband and family. Right. So really, when this journey began, um, I really thought, this would be over and done with, you know, within a matter of days. So I actually was kind of relieved when I was admitted to the hospital because I figured I'm in the right place, I'm in the right spot, and this is going to be uncovered and I'll be home, back to work, back to the family. So leading up to the ICU portion um, of the journey, honestly, um, you know, hospital stay was fairly routine. Um, I was only in for about 12 hours um, before I completely crashed, meaning organ failure um, and, you know, kind of put into that acute level of care. Um, but really, after my admission, my husband and I were talking, um, I was interacting with nurses, and it was probably within... Um, a few moments of uh, Brian's arrival the next morning after I was admitted that everything took a turn. And the only real memory that I had prior to that related to the acute care was looking at Brian and just kind of giving him that cut sign that I was trying to tell him that I couldn't breathe. And between fevers and breathing challenges, um, those were my real memories before completely crashing and then being in truly in the hands of those doctors at St. Peter's. Those doctors prepared your husband for the worst because it did not look good. Right, exactly. The, um, you know, kind of the, obviously the chief area of focus was lungs. Um, I was on a ventilator. I was put in a medically induced coma um, because there were so many things going on between the organ failure, my lungs not working, quite frankly, and um, I, was, I was in complete uh, atrial fib. And, um, you know, from that standpoint, the doctors said she's got to be at the lowest level of function so that we can start to really unpack what's going on here. So my pulmonary doctor, my pulmonologist, really took Brian aside after I had crashed, after machine upon machine and, and whatnot um, was brought into my room uh, from his account. Um, and, and she just said, listen, I have to be honest with you. We're going to do everything we can. She was stunned by my symptoms, by the level um, that this escalated to so quickly and basically said to him, yes, um, does, you know, Marissa have family that's local? And obviously my husband said yes. And she said, you had better call them because I don't think she'll make it through the night. And that was really about... 24 to 36 hours after I was admitted. Miraculously, you're here. You, you recovered. Mm -hmm. You weren't out of the woods. Doctors then deliver the news. We have to amputate both legs below right. the knee. Right. How do, were you able to process that? Well, first, it was horrific, I will tell you. Um, the thought, the concept, the race of emotion based on life, based on family activities. Um, I knew at that moment, my life would never be the same. And what we had agreed upon was about, you know, six weeks 
um, my, physically, I would have required fit six weeks anyway um, of, you know, rehabilitation to the best of my ability in the hospital um, on top of the physical rehabilitation once I had made it out of the coma, made it off of a ventilator. Um, there's a lot of requirements, quite frankly, in order to really come back to life. And we said, while, while I'm at that, we're going to try to understand if those skin tissues are going to come back. And, you know, the, the miraculous piece of this was, you know, the necrosis, which is the, you know, the dead skin tissue as a result of treatments for septic shock, um, you know, I had skin tissues come back from my knees to my ankles, which was, you know, truly a blessing. Um, but it was really my feet um, and, you know, some of the complications that comes as a result of a longer term necrosis um, diagnosis. And what happens there is, you know, that necrosis goes right to the bone. So unless you have healthy tissue and healthy bone, they're really, you know, you need to understand um, how far your amputation must go in order to land at that tissue that's healthy and bone that's healthy. So you went on to Sunnyview for rehabilitation. Right. You returned home mm -hmm. on Holy Thursday. Your mother contracted COVID-19, went into the hospital, and passed away on Easter Sunday. Yes. How are you able to share the story about survival, the pain that you've been through? What is the, the reasoning behind it? Um, you know, I think... It was such a crazy time um, back then. You know, I, I think about it now, and it, it really is almost unreal still. Uh, something that we as a family struggle with really digesting and metabolizing. And it's been three years. And so, you know, it's something that it is as I will describe, brute force strength. You know, when you are faced with obstacles that I think no one could ever predict, you really find who you are. And that's deep thought, um, a lot of reflection. Um, and you know what? A lot of falling down a lot of, um, you know, whys, but I think you come out of that trying to be a better person based on some of the experiences that come to you. So you turn pain into action. What do you believe is your purpose now? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny, when I was in the hospital, I remember, you know, talking with Brian, um, I was, you know, doing much better. I knew I had a, a road ahead. Um, and I remember looking at him and I'm looking down at my legs. I'm, I'm, I haven't had my surgery just yet. And I said to him, you know what? I think I've got my purpose now. And he looked at me and he said, you know, what does that really mean? And I knew that as difficult of a journey that I was headed for, I was given a second chance. And my thought process on that is in much of what I do, not everything, I'm human, but in much of what I do, what I like what I really pers what I really wish to emulate is giving back and giving to people. And I think even in my daily life, um, in, in a sales role, every interaction that I have, whether it's internal or external client facing, I think about what that person might be going through. And I never thought like that before. Maybe never is a little strong, but rarely. So my purpose is really about empathy 
and bringing, you know, my struggles, quite honestly, are very apparent, right? Um, to some degree, um, but not everybody's are. So it's really a matter of kind of putting my myself in, in their place, in their shoes, and working with a mindset that's focused on others. What has this journey taught you about yourself mm -hmm. that you did not know? Right. So I think the journey really, um, you know, it teaches, I think all of us, if you're open to it, and that's always been a caveat for me, you have to be open to it. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you can turn adversity, you know, into learning and that learning becomes your success. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a lot out of this experience that, you know, has taught me I'm human has taught me that um, I'm a hard charger. I've got that determination, it's innate, but honestly, you are human and it's okay to fail. It's okay to kind of back off, maybe take a little bit you know, of a stance of a boundary, say no. But I think you know, the piece that resonates with me is, picking yourself back up and it's okay to have those, you know, days, um, maybe few days where you're down, but you know, at the end of that, it's also important to recognize that you do have the ability to pick yourself back up. You have done that with such grace. Um, you know, from watching you and, uh, learning from you. Uh, you returned to work right away. Mm -hmm. You fitted the, your vehicle so that you could keep your independence to drive. Right. I'd love for you to talk and, and share that with us um, so that the viewers and the listeners can hear about that. Yep. Um, well, the grace part, <laughs> I think that uh, my family might, you know, disagree with that statement. Um, it was a road. It was a long road. Um, I think I had no idea. Um, I had expectations that were wild relative to how I would progress, uh, certainly with fitting of prosthetics um, and getting myself on the road back to life. And um, first of all, on the work front, honestly, Megan, I know myself and I knew that was part of healing. Uh, selfishly, um, I think that, you know, from my standpoint, I needed accountability. Um, and not only to myself, but to others. And I had an opportunity, given really where the world was at that time, um, to come back to work and utilize, you know, my skills and bring back a sense of normalcy, even if it was you know, eight to five, thereabouts, um, in a work setting. And I think that was one piece that really brought me through some of those darker days. And as I worked through prosthetic fittings, as I walked with a walker around the house, around wherever, um, going to baseball games, in a wheelchair, um, because my prosthetics weren't fitting just yet, you know, all gave me a sense of perspective that hands down, I would literally not have had. And I knew that I just needed to keep pushing forward, even though I may not have been mastering every skill, you know, just between walking, you know, getting daily light living down, I knew I just needed to, to pursue. And that's really where, you know, even the vehicle, you know, fitting um, with my hand controls came in. You know, Brian and I, my husband, we, we, we just said, let's get the vehicle, let's get it fitted. And as soon as you're able to get yourself certified, uh, you know, by DMV as being able to drive, your car is there. And that was always the forward momentum 
um, you know, the, the way in which as a family we looked forward. And so I took that power, you know, that came from my husband, from my children, you know, from my extended family that really, I, I say it, I say it today, you know, brings me to this day with you. So what, what got you through some of those most difficult days? Um, for me, Megan, what got me through was my family. Um, I had some pretty hard times um, after, especially when I arrived home. And reality really sets in. And you look around and you realize that this is my life. Uh, this isn't a, you know, temporary situation. Maybe the, that very current situation arriving home um, in a wheelchair and, you know, bandaged and that was temporary. But I knew that in order to get back to my life and what I enjoy doing and having a good time and having fun, I took so much strength from my family. And I think right there next to it, is faith. And the two of those pieces um, were so integral to my recovery and my pursuit and desire to move forward. And in those moments, in those days, sometimes longer, where I really had, you know, very little desire or very little willingness is where that power of prayer and the power of my faith came to be a huge piece of my work, my ability, and you know my pursuit to move forward. Marissa, thank you. I have told you this, I'll tell you again, you are absolutely an inspiration. I know for me personally, um, you know, there was a lot of conflict I had in a very unhappy marriage and through talking with you, that made me realize that I did have the strength within. So thank you for that. You're welcome. My pleasure. Um, but I, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Um, I do think that this is going to resonate with so many people. So thank you. Thank you.